No, that's, that's spot on. All right, is this, uh, can we be, are we, am I being heard? All right, welcome back. Um, thanks for coming back. That was pretty good. Got a high percentage of people coming back. Um, even better than my first day of semester in college. Do you know that we, these kids are sophisticated. We have examples of kids that will go to, they will enroll at two colleges, and then if they withdraw at a certain time, then they don't have to pay. And so they'll check out two colleges and then during the first two weeks figure out which one it is and leave the other school hanging. This is, this is, this is serious business there. All right. Okay. So um, I would like to open it up to questions right now. What I have left is scientist, philosopher, and maybe artist. Um, we definitely need to get to the problem of evil. I'd like to talk science a little bit and also the moral argument for the existence of God and then perhaps beauty. Um, in any order you want to. But um, is there anybody that had any questions right now or during the lunch break that they want to bring up right now? I want to give you guys an opportunity to speak. Yes? I, I would go with the latter. Uh, no, but uh, <laughs> uh, the question is about dinosaurs. What, you know, all the questions about dinosaurs and that there's different opinions that Christians have about when they live, did they live at the same time as human beings, what happened to them, all this kind of stuff. My answer is I have no idea. <laughs> I have absolutely no idea and I don't want to know and I don't want to. Um, but I'm glad you brought that up for a couple reasons. One is... Um, the next step is to talk about a scientist's vocation. And I'm convinced that the average Lutheran pastor and the average um, middle school biology teacher, if they would have a conversation and argued about dinosaurs or evolution or anything like that, that uh, most, of, most of the time both of them would be wrong. It's, this is outside of our, our realm, right? And um, I think that it's, it's, uh, it's very dangerous place to be for both the pastor and the scientist to say, just to assert this is what happened. I think we need to have a whole lot of humility here. As God, you know, as we find out in Job, were you there, God asked, when I laid the foundations of the earth, right? So, for example... <clears throat> Um, do I believe in a six 24-hour creation? Sure. Um, but I have, I don't think there's any scientific or archaeological evidence for that. Now, you may disagree with me, and that's fine. I just don't think that's very good science. When I get up to heaven and, and, and they ask me the three questions to get in, because there's going to be a test, you all know this, right? And of course, one of the questions is going to be evolution or creation, right? You know? And I'm going to go six 24 hour days because that's what you said, man. And I'm just going to walk out. You can't blame me. <laughs> Even though that one's a real hard one to, to understand. So I put uh, the six 24 hour creation in the category of um, Christ's real presence in the, in the Lord's Supper, certain miracles and stuff like that where I go, that, that, one's, that, one's, that one's by faith. <laughs> that one's by faith, for sure. Like, I, I, can, I can get you to, like I did, at least maybe the resurrection sort of plausible. Um, I can get you to, I think there's good evidence to believe that there's a soul and thus a spiritual world. 
I think I can get you to, there's good evidence that there is some sort of thing that created this place because things don't pop into existence, those things. I don't know if I can get there with, with uh, Ken Ham and Answers in Genesis, my opinion. So the dinosaur question is, I'm just going to say I really don't know. And I think that's the best tactic because I think humility goes a long way in that situation. So that is my long way of not answering your question. Sometimes, yeah, sounds familiar, yeah. Um, this is what you do. You keep talking until people forget what they asked. I, I, I'm, I'm serious. I just don't know, and I can't, I can't give an answer. Yeah. Um, can we go down the science road for a little bit? Would that be OK? Or has anybody else got something? All right. I, I think that, especially when it comes to evolution, that evolution <clears throat> is not really great science. And I'm not saying that as a Christian. I'm just saying that as a human being. And most people would agree that evolution has a lot of holes in it. And um, there's microevolution and macroevolution. Uh, microevolution, like within species, nobody has a problem with that, right? That there's evolution within, within species. Nobody has a problem with that. It's the macroevolution that species jump. Uh, it's the macroevolution that is going to give us, is going to claim that we, we, we popped into existence out of nothing that there's a big bang theory, whatever it is. Um, there's holes in that, and everybody understands that. So why do we keep evolution, why is that still kind of understood as the de facto way of looking at the world? Well, two reasons. One, of our, I've already said that within species, that certainly is applicable. The second is it works and it's useful. So here's something that we don't really understand in our, our time period, especially as layman to science, unless you're a scientist. And that is, there's such a thing as called scientific realism and scientific anti-realism. So a scientific realism says that when I run an experiment based off of information that I have, so for instance, I'm coming from an evolutionary mindset and I'm thinking about that when I set up an experiment, I have a hypothesis, conclusion, and stuff like that. I'm saying that my, my prior knowledge that is used to set this up has, is corresponding with the world. It's real, scientific realism. But for a long time, uh, that was not really the concern of science. Uh, what we call modern science, and that you could be a scientific anti-realist. Not that you're anti-reality, but you meant this. I'm running an experiment based off a theory that may or may not correspond with reality. That's not my main point. My main point is, are, is this going to work? Are the calculations going to work? So an example. Um, you have uh, Newtonian physics and you have Einsteinian physics. When you run experiments and run calculations, in a lot of cases, both of them work. <laughs> they both work. Um, <clears throat> when it came to the Copernican revolution, that uh, the Earth is going around the sun and not the sun going around the Earth, um, a lot of people were like, yeah, it's probably that the, the Earth goes around the sun, but the calculations are a lot easier when we do the Ptolemaic way of looking at it. And they flat out said that. Their concern was not that they would have this grand narrative. Their concern was, do our calculations work? We'll worry about that. That's important, but we're more concerned with that. So, for instance, when we look back at the Galileo affair, from a post-enlightenment, we're the smartest people on the block, and that includes God as human beings, and we can figure everything out, and we can get down to the molecule, and we can reduce everything that we know everything, like analytics and baseball <laughs> kind of thing, yeah? Um, that is when we look back in the Galileo affair and say, oh, the church was trying to silence Galileo. But when you actually look at the details, they didn't care that much. 
Galileo, it was a, more of a personality thing. They actually funded Galileo. He was best friends with the Pope. He was a jerk to the Pope, and then the Pope was a jerk back, and stuff like this. And you start to realize that we look back at upon it and say this was such a complete reorder of the way we looked at the world, because we're thinking in these grand schemes that we have everything understood. They didn't really care that much. They're like, I could totally see that, Copernicus, has theory. Um, but the Ptolemaic way of looking at the universe is more helpful for us, right? So I think that's the reason why there's a lot of scientists who are going to say evolution, for sure there's holes in it. But it's kind of all we got. And I need that as kind of a basis for looking at the world. Um, maybe one example, and I'm going to get off this because I think I've lost half of you. Um, I think I've lost myself. All right. Uh, remember when, um, well, they're still going around, but all the diets that said if you get out carbs, everything's great. Yeah, okay. So <clears throat> instead, of, instead of just saying that, there was always a theory that came around with it. Because there's a basis, a worldview by which you are gonna, you're going to uh, put forth your theories. So the theory was this. Um, as mankind evolved, um, you know, we were hunters and gatherers. So that means meats and vegetables. And then once we produced, once we started producing um, grain and became grain farmers, that's when we started to the DNA change and stuff like that, right? Now, I may get to the point at the end that says, okay, carbs are not, you know, we're, we're, we have too many carbs, okay? Vegetables, meat, that's what's better for you, whether you agree with it or not. We get to that point. I could have started with evolution, but I didn't have to. But we started with evolution, why? Because that's our mindset, right? We have to have something to start with. And it doesn't necessarily mean that evolution is, a, is an all-encompassing in theory. That's not the point. The point is, is it works for us, right? So that's my long way of saying that I don't think we need to be pro-evolution or anti-evolution. Like, those are things that happen in the media. But in reality, um, evolution is, uh, can be useful, can be helpful, microevolution is okay. What we're saying is you have two big flaws there. One is you have no proof that species moves from, uh, 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 to another species. Number two, you haven't explained how uh, the original amount of energy came from. And maybe a third one. A third one is that you have no room for morality in a purely Darwinistic um, evolutionary mindset. All right, I'm going to stop there. <laughs> that was a lot. And I don't know if I was very clear. Would anybody like me to repeat anything or have a cha or challenge me on this? I just want to add that there is there are scientists now that believe more in um, intelligent design, mm -hmm. that the universe points, nature points to intelligent design, and that there are flaws in Darwin's theory, and that uh, usually when we have a mutation, it's kind of just yeah. Absolutely, and I think, you know, it, our society is so polarized that if you criticize evolution, you're anti-science, or if you're pro-evolution, you don't believe in Jesus, and, and it's just so much more complicated. And this is my long-winded way of saying, don't fall apart, <laughs> don't necessarily pick sides, right? Um, uh, there, there's bigger fish to fry here, right? Um, yes, thank you for that comment. Um, Good enough? Um, okay. I chalked it up to the foolishness of God, which I think is another thing I learned from your father. Yeah. Is that God is just so big and unable to understand. Hence, my inability to understand him. Yeah. I don't know his time frame. Yeah. This could be a thousand years. Yeah. So I don't have a problem with the dinosaurs in man's observation. Yeah. Because I don't understand God's time. Yeah. So it's a big thing. Yeah. I'm middle man. I, I think, yeah. And, and I, and here, let's go, to, let's go to Genesis 1 and 2 without trying to be controversial here. <clears throat> I think I have my timeline right 
that Moses wrote that before Charles Darwin existed. I'm pretty sure I got that. Okay. So he, <laughs> he was not writing against evolution. But he was writing against something. And what he was writing against was the idea that the physical is bad and that um, and that human beings were cursed by having bodies. And we know that because after every stinking day, what does he say? This is good, right? Like every day. And God said, this is good. After like the third day, you're like, I think he's trying to tell us something here. Well, if you're living in the ancient world, this world stinks. And you are cursed. And there was, a, there was an idea, whether it be in Eastern religions, of trying to get out of the cycle of, of, of reincarnation, or in the Western way, which culminates, I think, at least maybe not direct connection, but the, the Greek philosophers thought about this two way, that you're in a prison in your body. You could totally imagine that without modern science. I mean, even with modern science, right? The body betrays us. And so um, the idea that you're trying to get out of it through some sort of enlightenment, reincarnation, cycle, whatever, was really, um, I think it would have been very striking if you would have read the Genesis account that this is good, this is good, this is good. I am pleased with this. I am pleased with my creation. Now, <clears throat> we don't know this for sure, but I think there's pretty good evidence that so in the ancients, it, uh, we, have, we have evidence after Moses. We don't have evidence of the religions during the time of Moses, but after Moses, where um, they would build a temple, and then they would put a statue of their god in the temple, and they called that the, the imago dei, the image of God. So I build an A-frame in 1967. <laughs> And then I put my image of God in there. And often the image of God would be like on, on, on like rollers. And the image of God would go out and people would bow down. And everybody knew that this wasn't the exact God. Right? But this was the presence of God. The image of God was not just a photograph. It was something a little bit more. It wasn't exactly God but it wasn't just kind of a photocopy of God, a picture of God. It was something else. It was the um, image of God. And the, the sculptor who, would, who sculpted the God would say, no, this is your God, this kind of idea. And they would go through a, a, a fake ritual that he would cut off his arms, fake, fake cut off his arms and say, I have, no, I have no hands. And so therefore, this just appeared out of nowhere, right? And maybe that would carry on to a myth. The idea was this. You build God a house, you put the image of God in the house, and then you sacrifice to the image of God to make the gods happy. And we find that in multiple religions, including ones in around Israel, right? That I offer something to this image, and then somehow it goes into the spiritual world. So God, and the gods are always hangry, right? So you got to give them food. Yeah, okay. So now let's go back to Genesis 1 and 2. Uh, we have we have a roof, and we're gonna put some we're gonna put some nice lighting in the roof, like the sun and the moon and the stars, and we got the we got the ground, and we got the vegetation and whatever, and we're gonna make this home with vegetation and stuff. And what is the last thing they do? God, uh, uh, Moses says God puts into his temple the image of God, but who's the image of God? You and me specifically Adam and Eve. And everything's flipped upside down. Instead of I am bowing down to this hangry God all the time and building him a house and the image is in there, God builds me a temple and I'm the image of God and I'm honored and that's the beginning of human rights, quite frankly. Right? So in our creation evolution debate, which is necessary and stuff like that, don't miss the point of human rights and the physical creation being good, because I think those are the two highlights of Genesis 1 and 2. The image of God and good, 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 good. You may not, like my, you may not agree with my conclusions, that's fine. I'm not saying that, that, that that's exactly what Moses was thinking. But you cannot deny the image of God and that everything was good are two big highlights of that thing. 
And, and it's only a side note um, that there's, you know, he created the species different and stuff like that, right? It's not a treatise against Darwin. It's a treatise against this idea that human beings don't matter, right? Okay. All right. Um, let's do this. Um, let's go to, um, oops, wrong way. Let's go to the fine tuning of the universe. Um, now, let me give you one more caveat. Everything that I say today, if you Googled, there would be 10 answers against what I said today, right? This is not, boom, this is the truth. This is having a conversation with somebody, and there's, there's a back and forth, right? And especially as we're going to get into science and philosophy, the arguments um, are ancient, actually, and there's people that will go against it and, and go back and forth. All I'm saying is I think we can play ball. As Christians, I think we can play ball in this world, and we shouldn't cower in fear. One of them is the idea of the fine-tuning of the universe. So um, even the um, secular scientist, and, and what I mean by, and, and, and not the actual scientist in the laboratory, but the, but the Bill Nye's on TV kind of thing, um, <clears throat> who, by the way, real scientists are going to like, kind of roll their eyes sometimes at those guys. Um, that they will say that it sure seems like the universe is designed. As if it was just for the purpose that we would, be, we would have life. And in fact, the natural way people talk in scientific terms assumes purpose. So for instance, if I say, um, why did... Why, why, does the tree, um, ha, why does the tree lose its, its leaves in the fall? And a scient, uh, scientist, uh, a botanist, gives an answer for that. But once I have said the word why, or what is the purpose of this, I have, I have left the realm of evolutionary theory. Because evolutionary theory is only based on chance that there is no purpose in biology. It just happens to be. It just happens to be the conditions were just right for life. But if you're going to be honest, then you have to not ask the why question or say the reason or purpose or anything like that. Let me give you an example. Or let me take it to the next step. So if the force of gravity is just off, if we have a little bit more radiation in our atmosphere, if we're this closer to the sun, we all blow up, you know, we're all burned up. If we're just this further away from the sun, it's far too cold for life, right? So <clears throat> there are so many little things that are so precise for just life that, like a Bill Nye and other people will say, we won the cosmic lottery that everything just was absolutely just perfect for life to exist. Now, <clears throat> um, think about like a, a, like, a, like a soundboard with all the little, little knobs, yeah? And each knob's got a click, 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 and it's got like a thousand clicks on it. You have to have all of those just precisely right, otherwise we don't exist. So the question becomes, was this chance or was this design? Well, um, <clears throat> It sure looks like design to me and not chance, or a combination of design and chance. Now, the argument against that is to say, so what? We're here. That proves that, yeah, it was one in a gazillion, but here we are. Well, hold on f for a second. One is, that's not a good argument, <laughs> right? Number two, um, uh, number two, you still haven't told me where the beginning whatever came from. So uh, a lot of uh, pseudoscientists, and I mean the guys on TV and writing and stuff uh, in popular magazines will say, oh, we can get something out of nothing. I mean, because that's the, that's the Christian answer. Like, okay, if you believe in a Big Bang Theory. By the way, did you know who came up with the Big Bang Theory? What his day job was? Can't remember the guy's name. a love pair or something. He was a Catholic priest. And uh, he was rejected right away because many scientists understood that if you, if you sign on to a Big Bang, uh, that means that there's a beginning. 
And if there's a big bang, there's a big banger. <laughs> Somebody did this. Because don't things just pop into existence. Right? So now we're going to say, oh, I think things can pop into existence. Like, theoretically, there could be a vacuum, or there could be an empty space, or there could be some sort of magnetic field with energy or whatever. And the scientist says, see, you could have things pop into existence. And the philosopher comes along and says, I think you have a different understanding of the meaning nothing. And this is really kind of an important thing. Like, this will ruin the rest of your weekend, by the way. <laughs> think about what nothing is. I'm not talking about empty space, because empty space is something. Don't talk about a vacuum in space, because that's a something. Don't talk about what I, no, I mean nothing, nothing. Ruin your weekend. <laughs> and you can understand, like in the 1800s, when the, the, the biologist and the people who are like, let's, 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 let's cure diseases, and, and, and Jurgen's over in the corner, you know, you know, curled up in the fetal position, like, Jurgen, what are you doing? Thinking about nothing. And they're like, screw him, we're going to go try to, you know, try to figure out how to cure diseases, right? And you can understand that there was a move towards science and something that was practical and not these ridiculous philosophical or religious questions, right? So, but there still remains this question. How do things just pop into existence? Can we really do that? Maybe I can, I can jump ahead to philosophy since we're on that, and I'll come back to more scientific things. And that is um, contingency. So contingency works like this. Now I'm on page five, if you are following along. Um, you don't have to. Contingency is basically this, that things don't just pop into existence. I'm contingent on my parents, who are contingent on their parents, who are contingent on their parents, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on, and so on. The problem with that is I can't have what we call an infinite regress, that we can't just keep going, 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 and going, and going, and going, and going. There must be something that actually says, this was the first thing. So the Greeks would call it the prime mover. Um, whatever it is, the first, the first big bang, the first bit of energy, the whatever, you have finally have to get to that. Now, um, for a long time, uh, there was an idea that maybe the universe was eternal and it just always existed. But the problem with that is that nobody actually believes that, right? Because of our concept of time and space coming from one point and going, like a big bang. Or just the fact that, you know, the, the, this is controversial, but you know, the, the first and second rule of, of thermodynamics, that we only have finite amount of energy and you cr can't create more energy. And if we were here forever, we would already ran out of energy. But here we are. Yeah, right? Uh, tr people try to get away with this with the multiverse. So we maybe have one universe, and then it contrasts and then explodes to another universe, and kind of like this, and maybe that explains that. Well, no, it doesn't, because universe, by definition, is the whole thing. So multiverses is an oxymoron to begin with. You still haven't explained how this whole thing got here. So. <clears throat> I can maybe have this conversation and say, okay, it seems to me that everything that began to exist has a cause. Things don't just pop into existence. So then, what is the original cause? That's the argument. Now, the, the counter argument would say, we don't know enough about causes to really say anything about original causes of the universe. You weren't there when we lay the foundations. Fair enough. Um, but I still kind of think there has to be something. Right? There has to be something. So, dear skeptical friend, let's just play along. Humor me for a little bit. Let's say there is a something there. What would that something look like? Well, I would think pretty darn powerful. And I'm going to say pretty darn smart. And if it's powerful and smart, that seems to lead me maybe possibly not to an impersonal force, but a mind, a person, a free agent. Nothing forces it. Creative, all of these kinds of things. 
this seems to me like, I know you don't want to use the God word, but it's kind of what we're after here, right? That maybe there, it's at least plausible, right? That there could be a being outside of time and space that could do this. In fact, this seems to be the most reasonable, re reasonable position because otherwise you have to believe in either an infinite regress that we just keep going and going and going and going and going or that things just pop into existence without, without any cause. And I, I don't have enough faith for that. You know what I'm saying? I don't have enough faith for that. By the way, the problem with the argument for contingency or cosmology, this is a cosmological argument. Cosmology just means the study of causes. Um, is you're nowhere near Jesus or, or even love, <laughs> right? This could be any God. This could be anything, right? But I think it is helpful to say to somebody, be like, can you really, can you really sit there and tell me that this world just popped into existence without a cause? That the vast majority of people in the history of the world and some pretty darn, pretty smart people assume that there had to be something, right? Okay. Um, let's go back to some scientific things which I think are actually pretty interesting. By the way, here's the... It's called the, often called the Kalam cosmological argument because the cosmological argument's been there since Aristotle. But there was an Islamic thinker um, that made this Kalam cosmological argument. The universe, does it have a beginning? Yes. Um, you can't see the lines, but is it no beginning? Yes, it's beginning. Uh, can a beginning be uncaused? No, so it has to be caused. If it's caused, can it be impersonal? No, it has to be personal. So you get to a personal God. But that's as far as you go. You don't find his name. And you don't know if he loves you or not. In fact, if you look at nature, it seems like he's pretty angry at us. He, she, or whatever it is. Yeah. OK. Um, I'd like to talk near-death experiences. <laughs> I bet you didn't see that turn coming. All right. So there is such a phenomenon called near-death experiences that uh, people are cataloging these things. And um, there is a, a group associated with the University of Virginia, the first university on United States soil that was not tied to a church. So this is not, this is not a Christian-based whatever. Um, and um, this group associated with that is cataloging what we call near-death experiences. Now, this is very difficult to start with because um, we're not quite, it's very difficult to define death. I don't know if you know this. Like if I asked you, when does someone die? Um, and I would say, don't give me a soul answer, like when the soul departs from the body. Give me a clinical answer. I bet you I get three or four. Stop breathing, no brain activity, the heart stops or whatever. It's actually kind of hard. It's difficult to do that. Now, what we're talking about near-death experiences is something that's near death however you're going to define that, where there's an experience that cannot be fully explained um, just from a biological or neurological way. All right. Now, we have so many of these that, again, they're being cataloged. Like with prophecy, I'm going to give you three categories. Two categories have no purpose for us apologetically. The first category is somebody says, I saw something or I experienced something. The amount of people who have hallucinations is like upwards of 50%. Um, I don't know how many times I've sat at the end of, uh, or at, the, at a kitchen table of a widow who would say, last night, Pastor, I saw Frank. Frank's been dead for 10 years, husband Frank, as in 10 days. And I would say, Gertrude, how many times I could tell you not to eat meatball sandwiches after midnight, you know, something like that. I wouldn't say that, I would say, I don't think so. I try to be nice. I say, I don't know. You know what I do know? Bible, right? And then we go to the Bible and give comfort of you're going to see Frank again. You're going to see Frank again, right? That is totally, I mean, I can't, I can't prove that. The mind plays tricks on, on how many times you wake up in the middle of the night and you think that that dream is real. I don't know how many times I've checked the front door just in case, right? Just in case, that kind of thing. Um, so I'm going to eliminate it as a possibility. And a lot of these stories get spun out of control and become books and movies that turn out to be frauds later. So don't put your hope in these kinds of stories. The second one is when someone's in a coma and they can uh, tell you what happened in that room. So we have tons of stories of like, 
I was floating above and I could, I could tell, I could repeat what the nurse said to the doctor. And it was highly specific, you know, like, oops, where's my watch? No, something, you know, something like that, right? Uh, or, or I made a mistake or something like that. That, boy, that's weird. There's one famous case where uh, there is a lady in a coma who got a nurse and doctor fired because the nurse and doctor were doing things to each other in the hospital room where they didn't think anybody was conscious. So <clears throat> I'm going to eliminate that as well, and here's why. Because the brain is the, is the last frontier of the scientific world, and who knows what information is coming in. So um, uh, Pastor is nodding his head because he has been to many hospital, and he says, talk to the person in the coma because who knows what they can do is here, right? And seeing families cry and say their last words as if they could hear, and then you, there's some movement there, right? We don't know what the brain is capable of. But then the third category is somebody who is in a coma and can tell you about something at a different location with high, high specificity. Now this one's weird. So apparently there's been quite a few cases. Uh, the one that I distinctly remember as I was studying this was um, this girl who, who drowned or nearly drowned, was in a coma. Um, I can't remember if it was medically induced or not. And the doctor sent the family away. He said, there's nothing you can do tonight. We'll call you if something comes up. So they go home, they have dinner, or they're eating. And then the girl wakes up, and the doctors come in, and she starts talking about the family. And the doctors know about this phenomenon, so they call the family back, and before they let the family see the daughter, they ask specific questions of the information they got from the daughter, and it matched up. Like, my brother said this, or mom had this specific whatever. I can't remember the specifics. I don't know, right? Can there be a possibility of an out-of-body experience? Well, from a Christian point of view, we have no problem with that because, because how, many, you know, how many funerals have you been to? And you know that there's a distinction between the corpse, it's not technically a body anymore, the corpse in the coffin, and the real person who is in heaven. We understand that there can be a separation, right? So um, I, I think that this is, the, the reason I bring this up is twofold. One, it doesn't prove anything but a soul. But once you've proved a soul, you've, you've proved a spiritual realm. And once you're in a spiritual realm, now the discussion with maybe your atheist friend, now it's on your, it's on your turf now, right? Because you cannot, dear skeptical friend, fully explain humanity only by biological um, uh, adjectives and nouns and verbs. There is a spiritual realm here. And here is something from the scientific world, as in we just are going to look at the information and record it, that seems to lead us to a soul. Now, if there's a soul, that's a game changer. Let me, let me, let me touch on that for, for one second, then I'll maybe take a five second breather and, and let you collect thoughts. I think it's absolutely ridiculous to think that I could look at another human being and that I could completely explain that person via biology or neuroscience. I find that extremely insulting. That I think we all understand, even if we make a cognitive decision that there is no God, that there's something more going on than just my biology. And here's why. If I was a hardcore Darwinist and I only believed that I had um, just my biology, just my stuff, and there's no soul here, then um, when I was dating this lady named Amanda in college, and I got to the point that I wanted to marry her, I would have gotten down on one knee and I would have said this, if I was going to be honest with myself, if I was a true atheist and a Darwinist, and I was honest with myself and my words, this is what I would have had to say. I would have got down on one knee and I would have said, Dear Amanda, um, I am <clears throat> very happy that the chemicals in my brain make me feel funny around you and that my evolutionary impulses want to make babies with you and keep on the species. She said yes anyway, and we're married. How ridiculous. But if you're honest with yourself, that's how you describe a human being. 
But we don't say that. We say words like love and cherish and adore. Those are soul words. Those are not fully explained by biology. Now, a biologist would say, we have these chemical interactions in our brain that make us feel this way for evolutionary reasons. We give them words like love and desire and hate and wrong and evil and patience and all the virtuous words, all the soul words, but they don't really exist. So that means that the love that I have for my children and for my wife doesn't really exist. It's just a word I use to describe what's going on in my brain neurologically or in my body biologically. And I think you got to call people out on that and say, that's not how you live your life. When you hear about injustice in the world, you don't, you don't, you don't explain that in cold, hard biological facts. You say that's wrong. But once you say that that's wrong, you're in a different realm. All right, so uh, one more thing about, um, I promise five seconds, right? Is everybody with me or do any more explanations? Challenges, I'm totally fine being challenged on this. I'm, I'm doing the best I can with what I got. Here's another one with, with, with science and, and body. So there's a guy at UCLA, his name is Jeffrey Schwartz. I don't know if he still works there or not, but he wrote a book, The, the Mind and the Brain or something like that. And his point was that I'm not just the physical mush of my brain. So this is kind of interesting. Like when we say, when you use the word mind, what do you mean? Do you mean the brain? If you mean the brain, do you mean the mushy stuff? I think when, when we talk about mind, we're actually talking about usually consciousness. Well, what is consciousness? Is it a state of the brain? Okay, maybe, but is it just the brain matter or is it something else? Uh, by the way, kind of before I go down that path, just one way that helps me think is that I'm body soul, like I can't, it's very hard, it's like bone and marrow, right? I can't, but theoretically I know that my, my soul goes up into heaven and that my body will rejoin it so that there's something different. Like if I had to reduce myself, which I should not do, but if I had to, it's my soul who I am, not necessarily my body, but I'm an embodied soul. It gets kind of tricky. But when I think about the soul, we have different words for soul, and even in the Bible. Um, like if I say, uh, when I go to a JV basketball game and I see this little point guard running all over the place, I say, that guy's got a lot of heart. What does I mean that he has an enlarged heart? That's actually a problem, right? No, I mean he's got something. He's got some soul to him. Yeah? Uh, when I say mind, I'm talking about the soul aspect that is the intellect. If I talk emotion, all of these things actually are word for the non-physical thing that is me. Soul, spirit, mind, heart, all these things. But when I use those words, I'm describing one thing, the non-physical thing that's me, which we normally call the soul, but I'm highlighting something about it. If I'm highlighting my intellect, I use mind. If I'm highlighting my passion, I may use heart. If I'm highlighting my connection to God, I may say spirit. But I'm really talking about that one thing. Okay, back to Jeffrey Schwartz. Uh, he worked with patients who went through cognitive behavior therapy. So what we mean by that is uh, you go to the therapist and you say, I have debilitating anxiety. That coming into a room like this with multiple people, I cannot do it. I just cannot do it. I, I, it, I shut down. So the doctor says, I'm not going to give you some pills yet. We're going to work on it. So he gives you uh, or she gives you uh, uh, some things to practice on. So you come up. Um, I want you to drive to this, uh, to this church. And before you get out of the car, I want to say to yourself five times, um, they're not looking at me, they're not judging me, that's all in my mind. They're not looking at me, they're not judging me, that's all in my mind. And maybe at one point you, you build up the courage through these little practices to open the car door. 
and you come back and you go, doctor, I failed, and she says, no, you succeeded. Here's the next step. And she gives you little cues, and eventually you make it to the door. And eventually you sit in the back row, and that's maybe all you're going you're gonna to get. Right? You're never going to make it there, but we count that as a victory. Cognitive behavior therapy, yes? Okay. So what Jeffrey Schwartz did is he took pictures of the, he took brain scans during the cognitive behavior therapy, and he noticed that the brain matter actually changed during the process. Let's talk about that for a second. If you're into neuroscience, you're going to roll your eyes at me. I get it, but here's, here's how I understand it. Uh, brain matter can change, right? It's kind of like, um, well, if, if I, if I um, come home every day for 10 years and I open up the garage door to my house and I drop my keys there, and then one day my wife rearranges the living room and the table's over there, what am I going to do the first time? Drop on the floor, drop on the floor, drop on the floor, ah, ah, and eventually I get that. I'm making different connections in my brain, the C fiber firings, and it takes a while to stop that one and make this one. And I'm, I, sometimes it's, it changes the brain matter, like almost like grooves, like water going into a ground. So he takes these pictures of, of that, and then he asks the very obvious question, what changed the brain matter? There was no pharmaceutical, there was no surgery. It was just the doctor telling this person to do something. What changed the brain matter? Because the brain matter just doesn't change like that. It wasn't a natural pattern of growth or something like that. That could be replicated any other time. And he said there's a non-physical entity, entity going on there. That the brain, that, that the, 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 the non-physical thing, if you don't like the word soul, the non-physical thing is interacting with the physical thing. And they both change each other. And you don't, know, have, to, you don't, have, to, you don't have to think about this in a very complicated way to understand it. Because if you ever got dumped at 14, you felt it in your stomach. <laughs> because your, your, your eyeballs water when you hear a bad story, right? That the soul and the, the body interact with each other and they affect each other in very profound ways. And maybe, just maybe, this is controversial, but maybe, just maybe, Jeffrey Schwartz has found a way to prove that there is a soul from a scientific point of view. Like, what's the other conclusion? Yeah. So we have a neuroscience department at um, WLC, and many of them take apologetics class, and I always put them in a group with a project, and I give them this question every time. And every time they say, maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe. But they don't eliminate the possibility that this proves that there is a soul. This gets me to the bigger question about science. All right. Imagine this sentence floating in front of you. And this says, <clears throat> the only way we can get to truth is via logic or scientific experimentation. Let me explain that phrase. There is an idea that um, unless something is logically true, for instance, all unmarried men are bachelors, it's just true, or a right angle is 90 degrees. Let's think about right angles for a second. Nine, uh, right angle is 90 degrees. Do you find right angles in nature? I suppose you could if you looked hard enough, but we knew the concept before we found, it's not like there was a flock of right angles high in a tree and we discovered them. <laughs> Mathematical things are just true. So that's category one. I can find truth by logic, like kind of mathematical proof. The second way I find truth is if I run experiments that can be verified and repeated. Everything else is opinion. Uh, do you remember the Big Bang Theory, the show? Anybody watch that? This is why this show is so funny, because you have, this is very clever, you had a group of scientists who believed this, that unless it was verifiable, uh, through scientific experimentation, or if it was logically true, it was just opinion. Like the, the humanities were just the opinions. 
But why is it funny? Because these, these young men are still in the real world and they have mothers and grandmothers that they love and they can't explain why. That's why it was funny. And then they would, they would trip over themselves socially, right? But this was an idea that came about uh, 1800s, but really in, into the 1900s. So history is all opinion, English is opinion, philosophy is opinion, theology is opinion. All of those things are just opinion. So, and we can all get along. You know, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, it's all just opinion anyway. Right? <clears throat> Here's the problem with that. This sentence that says, truth can only be found by like logical proof or verified experiments, however you want to put it. That sentence before you is not a logical proof and you can't run any experiment to prove it's, that it's valid or not. The point is you have to do something that's outside of the hardcore scientists like chemistry and biology. You have to do philosophy. Everybody does philosophy. I don't care who you are. You have to start with philosophy. We call this concept first philosophy, right? So when someone dismisses you and you say, I think there's pretty good reasons there's a God, and you're like fine-tuning the universe and stuff like that, and they say, that can't not be proven. Out you go. That, that movement of them claiming you cannot be a part of this conversation because it's not scientific, that movement is not a scientific movement. It's a philosophical movement. It's just a bad philosophical movement. So I don't think we should heed, um, uh, I don't think we should um, uh, um, give up that ground in the battle, so to speak. Okay, now, so the near-death experience and the neuroscience and the soul, uh, which were found on page five, um, these were all, um, I think, ways where we can say, I think there's something going on that is more than the physical. If you don't like the term soul because it's too churchy, dear skeptical friend, fine. But I think you got to get to the point where you agree that there's something going on. Because you don't live your life only by biology. You don't. Because you were, use the words like right and wrong, love, hate, and all these kinds of things. And that'll lead us into the anthropological argument, with, which comes up a, a little bit later. Um, let me just uh, say one more thing about the soul. I'm not saying this is correct, but this, because the Bible, is not, the Bible is not written in a systematic way that says, lesson number one, soul. <laughs> lesson number two, body. Lesson number three, Jesus, right? Uh, it's a story, as my, as my um, Messianic uh, Jewish friend, classmate has said. But I think one helpful way to understand the soul and the body, because if, if you're kind of smart enough here, um, you will realize now or a little bit later on the ride home, you're like, there's something amiss about the separation of the body and the soul. Because doesn't that lead to this idea where my body is wrong, but my soul is right, so I can identify as anything I want? Well, my pushback would be that's actually a Gnostic a philosophical thought that says the body doesn't matter. I'm not saying that the body doesn't matter. I'm saying that they're inter interconnected in a very real way. I'm just saying that the body changes and that the soul is eternal, right? Uh, let, let me go down that path one second, and then I'm, I'm gonna uh, come back to something else. Um, th this is how, how I, I, another way I like to prove that there's a soul. And it's, and it's absolutely not correct, but it, I think it's funny. So I do it anyway. <laughs> I say, so I'll get up in like the classroom and I'll say, I'll say, uh, let's imagine kids that uh, <clears throat> 30 years ago I murdered somebody with an ax. And then I just say, I'm not saying I did or didn't. And then, and then I say, let's say I got away with it. And let's say 30 years later they found me because they found the ax and it had my fingerprints on it. And now I'm dead to rights. And I got no, I got nothing, right? They got the evidence. And there's no, it's gotta be murder because it's, there's, no, there's no statute of limitations. Here's what my defense would be. 
I would say, how could you throw me into prison for something a completely different person did 30 years ago? Because we, as we all know, you can't prove that there is a soul. And since the body's molecules are, you know, die and are regenerated, I mean, how many, I mean, my, I'm on my, what, like 30 years, how many different sets of skin, you know, do I have? Right? I am almost, if not completely, different set of molecules. How dare you blame me, 44-year-old Mike, for what the 14-year-old Mike did? It would be, that would be the height of injustice. This is, I would, of course, be my own lawyer. And I would say, that is the height of injustice that you would blame me for something completely different. I wasn't even there. Right? Now, I'm still going to jail, but think about what this means. How do you identify somebody if they don't have a soul? Is it that it's always just your one soul leads, one cell leads to another cell? And so, you know, there's a, there's a, a continuum there. But even if there was, the 44-year-old Michael is almost completely different than the 20-year-old Michael. I don't care if there's a connection there. Is it just a connection of memories? Is it just my DNA code? Even if it was just my DNA, DNA code, this guy with this DNA is not going to be an ax murderer like that jerk back then. I think we all instinctively understand that I'm the same person because there's more to me than just my body. This is how we live. One way to think about it is, if, if, I, if I had a guitar up here and I put it to my ear, would I hear music? If I had the sheet music in front of me of, of a song and I put up to my ear what I hear music, no. Um, the notes, the information, and the actual instrument are something different than the music. My body is the guitar. Perhaps you could say my DNA is the, the notes on the page. But neither of them is really me. Finally, I'm the music. Right? I'm something more. Right? And I think that can be helpful. I wouldn't push that too far because I don't like the separation of the body and the soul too much there because it gets us into trouble. But you've got you to gotta admit that I'm more than just my biology. Otherwise, I get down on one knee and I say to my wife, just isn't evolution great? <laughs> right? Yeah. Okay. So I owe you a break here. So let's take a, a quick just stretch up, go to the bathroom, get some water, and then we'll finish. We're definitely going to get to the problem of evil and the moral argument. All right. I think we'll, I think we'll get going here. We'll start, start back up a little bit. Um, Before I uh, go, I want to say two things. One is uh, to give um, the caveat once again that um, I'm outside of, you know, just saying, thus saith the Lord. That means I'm guessing with the rest of them, right? We're all guessing. We're all doing the best we can. Um, and I think that's the honest, I think that's the honest opinion to take. Um, and that is... I don't care who you are, I don't care how smart you are. Um, we're doing the best we can with, with, the, with the information that we have. And to have the humility to say that I can grow and that I can get more information. Um, uh, the, the other thing I wanted to say is, uh, there's a lot of people that ask me what book should, should you buy. There's hundreds, I don't even, I mean it's, and, and there isn't, I would say these are the two books that I would recommend. The first one is Religion on Trial, Religion on Trial, by a guy named Craig Parton, who's a lawyer from Santa Barbara. Many of you have heard of him. Um, small one, just a, it's just fun. It's just a fun read. Start there. Craig Parton, Religion on Trial. What you heard today is he, he taught me, <laughs> right? Now, if you want to get serious, and there, there are some... Um, um, every book's not going to cover everything, which is the, the frustrating thing. But one book that gives you a really good, here is what the arguments are, and I think in a decent way, 
is evidence that demands a verdict. Evidence that demands a verdict. And it's by the McDowells. It's a father-son duo, McDowells. That is the book that I make my college kids for a textbook buy. Just because it's like this big and it's 20 bucks. Uh, evidence that demands a verdict, right? And that's going to give you, like, it's a textbook kind of thing, but you can look up a chapter and say, oh, that's, I wanted to read on that particular issue. So I, I found those two helpful. Okay, and please don't feel free to email me if you have other questions or, or want other recommendations. Okay, with that said, you bet, sorry. Yep. And so, um, the way we influence other people's souls is very important, especially in the view of what's going on. Yeah. Let me come from a different angle and see what you think. In uh, St. Paul's um, first or second letter to the Corinthians, <laughs> yeah. um, he uses this analogy of when you talk to somebody, if you, if you look at somebody, you don't really know them unless you know their soul. Now, he's making the connection that the Holy Spirit gives faith. And I think it's, I, I ran this by a, a seminary professor, so I think I'm, I'm in good place. <laughs> it's actually kind of a clumsy analogy, but I think this is what he's after. Let me, let me give you an example. So this guy walks in to this room right now. He is, he is 6'4", he is 300 pounds, and he's ripped. And of course, he's wearing a skinny, you know, a 